Hello and welcome to Below the Surface. I'm your host, Tushar Shabdas. Uh, before we kick off the show, a quick reminder that you can ask questions in the comments um, and we'll make sure our experts answer them during the duration of the session. Um, if you have questions after the session, if you are doing it on demand, we will be monitoring the comments as well. Uh, with that, let's start the show. Uh, in today's show, we'll dig a little deeper at uh, what has happened to the log for shell vulnerability, where it has gone after all the hair on fire that we had uh, late last year, uh, the new Atlassian vulnerabilities that had people scrambling uh, to put protections in place uh, a few weeks ago, ransomware trends as it applies to application security, and a little bit more. Uh, to discuss this with me, uh, I would like to welcome to the show Nizan Myran, our VP of Application Security, and Anshuman Singh, our Senior Director of Application Security. Hey folks, welcome to the show. Hey Tushar, good morning. Hey, Tushar. hey. Uh, Nitsan and Anshuman, before we start the show, can you please tell us a little bit about yourselves? Uh, sure, I've been doing application security for uh, many years now, uh, probably around 20 years. Uh, I originally started in the Israeli military and from there moved on to a couple of companies. And uh, really my focus has been uh, protecting the smaller businesses that don't know how to protect themselves against uh, these kinds of attacks that uh, come in time and time again against them. Uh, so I currently run the application security business here at Barracuda. Hi, I'm Anshuman. I've been uh, with application security for the last 20 odd years myself. Uh, been doing application security for all sorts of companies uh, from very large to mid market and such. Uh, and I've had like great experience uh, with uh, kind of working with people and teams and uh, kind of figuring out all the application security things that have been happening. Uh, we've seen the application security market evolve. Uh, so it, it's been a very interesting journey for us. I'm sure that has. Um, so let's start with uh, what are the types of AppSec vulnerabilities that uh, Barracuda and you folks have been seeing recently in the field? And uh, what are some takeaways that you have with regards to what has been happening? Well, uh, you know, we really see everything. Uh, given how many sensors we have, we, we, we see things from zero days that, you know, the day after they come out, um, all the way down to uh, older vulnerabilities. Uh, we see the same IP addresses sometimes trying multiple exploits. Um, and and so, often we actually see these IP addresses and other scanning for, for old vulnerabilities as old as 2017. Um, and so there's definitely uh, a, a long tail and uh, we see them scanning for WordPress vulnerabilities. We see them scanning for jQuery vulnerabilities. And those of you that know uh, jQuery know that it's it's rather old at this point. It's not the newest uh, platform, but we still see a lot of scans going there um, and really trying everything they can, the old, the new, everything in between. Yeah, so what 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 has really happened on the on probably every type of vulnerability is that when a vulnerability gets discovered, there is a phase where it is manually uh, used by the attackers and then they automate that entire thing and do a better ROI on their effort. So th that's really what happens. Once it's automated, it keeps coming back. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, that automation brings us to log for shell and the uh, VMware vulnerabilities that made headlines starting last year. Are you still seeing attempts to exploit them? We absolutely are. Uh, it's dropped off uh, quite a bit from when it initially started. Uh, so the VMware uh, was disclosed in April of this year, uh, and there was definitely more of a spike then and things were dropping off, but uh, we keep mentioning the long tail. It's, it's absolutely still happening. We're still seeing those scans. Uh, the VMware vulnerability specifically is a, a privilege escalation plus uh, a couple of other vulnerabilities that are just sort of combined into one uh, big scary vulnerability uh, that really gives people access uh, into the system that shouldn't have access into the system. And in fact, uh, certain versions of VMware are also vulnerable to log4shell or the log4j vulnerability. So it's a sort of a double whammy. If you have the, the wrong version of VMware, you can really get into trouble. And of course, attackers know that and they're looking for that. Got it. Um, so 
with that, let's dive a little bit deeper into log for shell given the impact that that complex of vulnerabilities had. What are the types of exploits that we are uh, and we were originally seeing in the field? So before we kind of go into the actual vulnerability for uh, a few of our viewers, they may not be aware of what Log4Shell uh, is about or Log4J is about. Log4J is this uh, very kind of very used library, open source library that Java programs right, uh, use it to log all the data that they may need to log, uh, write to their log files and such. And so when the data comes in during the development phase, they would have integrated this library to write it out into the files. But what can happen is if a specially crafted data is sent and it that data part is picked up for uh, logging into the data, uh, into the file, it can be customized in a way that it gives much more access. And then you can go and do privilege escalation and lots of other stuff using this uh, vulnerability. So there are, because Log4j has been there out in the market for like tens of years, many, many applications use it. And uh, most of the web applications were all built using Java and JSP and all. So there are sufficient number of them. And so this vulnerability was a very critical vulnerability. Uh, Nizan, would you like to kind of talk about the other next details? Sure. Um... I think one of the things that really is surprising about the log for shell log for J vulnerability is that it was out in the open for such a long time. So this is not somebody recently introduced a vulnerability and, and somebody found it. This is a vulnerability that has literally been out in log for J versions for, I believe years, many years. Um, and just nobody thought of using log for J in that particular way until somebody finally did. And that's when everything uh, sort of took the internet by storm. Um, so when it was actually disclosed, which was late last year around Christmas, uh, those of you that were involved may remember not having a Christmas break or having to come back from your Christmas break. Um, very early on in the initial days of the attack of the, of the disclosure, uh, we were starting to see two types of scans. The first were uh, probing that was done by malicious actors, by attackers looking for vulnerable systems that they could exploit. Uh, but then as the weekend progressed, if you remember this happened at the end of the week before Christmas, uh, more and more traffic was actually coming from IT teams that were scanning their own infrastructure. So scanning tools were coming out, IT teams were scanning themselves to see if they were vulnerable. Um, there's sometimes a little bit of a gray area between those two because the attackers will also try to spoof the legitimate vulnerability scanner. So sometimes when you look at the traffic, it's hard to tell if it's a, a legitimate scanner running by running by somebody's IT team or if it's actually an attacker that's trying to find a, an exploit and actually use it. Um, so a, a lot of these, the, the, the problem with this log4j vulnerability is um, once you find a vulnerable system, you can get a shell there and you can do basically whatever you want. And so we were seeing um, this payload that was sort of like Mirai. For those of you that remember Mirai from a few years ago, it's uh, really just a, a bot. Uh, it installs itself on the compromised system and it connects to a command and control infrastructure that the attacker controls and the attacker can control it basically building a botnet. They build a botnet and then they can tell that botnet to go do whatever they want. Um, it, back in the day of Mirai, I was used for things like DDoS uh, floods, and I think uh, today that's less commonly the the exploit that people use, uh, just because so many people have DDoS protection. Um, but it is more common to see uh, crypto coin mining scripts. So taking advantage of these servers with very powerful CPUs to go and do mining, which obviously directly profits the attacker. So it's a very quick way to get cash out of uh, a compromised system. Yep. And it was interesting um, that uh, when the vulnerability was disclosed, it was like, this is the apocalypse. And so far, we haven't seen, or the other shoe hasn't dropped. We haven't really seen a massive uh, uh, breach because of log for shell and there was someone who made some weird comment to the effect of, uh, well, it's Java, probably the People going after these systems don't know Java. Not that it makes that much sense, but uh, people making up reasons. Uh, but given what we're seeing, do you think it's safe to say that uh, there is a long tail that is going to be following this log for shell vulnerability? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've seen this with all of the other vulnerabilities, the Heartbleed style vulnerabilities, you know, from previous years. Uh, there's always a long tail. 
uh, these scans continue happening for for literally years. Um, you know, while when the first when the vulnerability was first disclosed, everybody rushed and panicked and patched their systems. Uh, that doesn't mean that unpatched systems won't appear on the internet later on. So uh, mm -hmm. somebody may have hard coded an older version of an, of an operating system or a software package or a VM image. And so it may very well be that they've patched everything they have in production today, but next month they spin up a new system and it's actually running an old version that's still vulnerable. Um, so while it's, it's not the same scans that we saw in the beginning, attackers are still scanning, they're still looking, and they're still hoping to find those juicy targets with a vulnerable version of uh, Log4j. Um, the, the other issue is that a lot of these pieces of software are uh, basically abandonware. So the software that hasn't been updated in a long time, you know, maybe it's an application that's in use, uh, but nobody's maintaining it. And so there isn't really uh, a vendor to go after for software patches. It's maybe end of life. Um, and so it's, it's not really that easy to find uh, patches for, for those kinds of systems, especially when they're embedded all in one in a box, as opposed to an operating system that you can connect to and upgrade the packages one by one. Yeah, so there, there is an additional angle to all of this, right? Because nowadays, when you when a team is building an application, the, the part of code that someone really writes is a smaller part uh, compared to what all gets included as open source stuff. People get libraries from all over the places and they embed it. And there is no kind of a software bill of material type of thing being maintained by anyone. Uh, however, there are teams that are kind of trying to build all of that stuff. But uh, till the teams know what is uh, inside the software that they are using, or uh, maybe the teams are using a library which in turn uses another library, <laughs> you, you just don't know where all it will hit you. Got it. Yeah, the software bill of materials thing that is being talked about very seriously now probably makes more sense, but uh, I don't know how many software creators can actually give you an accurate SBOM of what they've actually included in the software. And that is always a thing to think about. Yeah, so now, in that, that it is, uh, it's a hierarchy, right? It's not only mm -hmm. me who needs to know about the software that I have included. I also mm -hmm. need to know the software that I'm including, what does that have inside it? So yep. it's kind of fairly tricky that way. Yep. Just before we got onto this, we were talking about uh, a slightly older vulnerability, Voxy mm -hmm. Shell, and uh, with actually seeing some ransomware groups trying to exploit Voxy Shell vulnerabilities. Um, what exactly are they trying to do with Voxy Shell and ransomware? And uh, is the application, uh, the web application, or any kind of application kind of the new attack vector for uh, ransomware now? It is. And in fact, we're seeing uh, in surveys and in data that, that application vulnerabilities, application attacks are becoming a, a major uh, attack vector for installing ransomware. So uh, this particular vulnerability, Proxy Shell, is an exchange, a Microsoft Exchange vulnerability uh, disclosed in, uh, I think, spring 2021. Um, and it's, again, it's one of those series of, like VMware, series of multiple vulnerabilities that all come together to allow an attacker to compromise and then move laterally and install uh, admin accounts and basically gain full control of the environment. Um, and so what, what we've seen uh, or, or what attackers have, have been doing is really using the proxy shell uh, vulnerability to uh, get into systems and create ransomware uh, attacks against those systems. So you get in, you move laterally, you grab a bunch of systems on the network, and then you encrypt them and you demand uh, a ransom to, to decrypt. Um, and so really applications are, it, it used to be that email was, it was the, I think the primary way to get ransomware into a system. And now that is actually changing and applications are becoming a big part of the way that uh, attackers build their ransomware systems. And it, I, the one thing that I want to mention is this ransomware as a service. So uh, everybody, we all know that in the IT industry, SaaS or software as a service is becoming much more popular. Um, people don't install their own applications anymore. They just uh, buy it from a SaaS vendor. Uh, the same thing is happening in the attack um, areas where attack companies are building ransomware as a service systems where you as an attacker can buy or subscribe to their system. 
Um, and then you can use their system to do all the decryption and man, you know, encryption, decryption, managing the keys, managing the, the ransomware. So uh, they make it really easy. All you have to do is get into the system and they do the rest. Right. Uh, the whole ransomware as a service thing kind of reminds me that uh, whenever a new technology comes in, uh, probably the first people to refine it would be the um, attackers and the people trying to exploit that uh, system. Uh, and a little while back, I was listening to a podcast, I forget which one it was, but they went deeper into how the Conti ransomware group was working. And it was interesting to see the dynamics between the various people who bought the service, how the service worked and all those things. So um, given that they're exploiting web applications, is this the only example that we have, Boxy Shell, or were there any other examples of ransomware being spread through web applications? No, the recent example of uh, the Kaseya hack on the on their uh, SVA system, uh, VSA systems, right? That that is where uh, the for people who may not know Kaseya, Kaseya is a company that uh, provides software for managed service providers, and managed service providers are organizations that provide IT services to maybe smaller organizations, right? There are lots of or smaller companies who or offices, doctor offices, lawyers offices, etc. They may not have their own IT team, so they will uh, contract it out to their MSP. MSP will manage lots of systems, and for MSP to manage these networks, they will use some sort of uh, MSP software like uh, Kaseya VSA. Uh, and what it the VSA system does it's a remote monitoring and management type of a tool. Uh, and so uh, what the hackers did was they went in and infected the VSA server. And whenever one of the clients actually connected to the server to download a patch or a, a software update, they got a malware infected payload, which then ended up installing a malware backdoor, uh, a ransomware system on, on the end clients, on the doctor's office or whatever that was being handled and it would encrypt that data and then you would go ahead and but according to Kaseya they say that only uh, 60 of their customers were infected but if you look at the entire chain there were more like a thousand organizations got impacted so that's like a software supply chain uh, thing that is happening and we need to be kind of uh, aware that it is not just uh, the primary infection which part of your body has the primary infection, it is the entire system that needs to be looked at. So that's kind of an example there. Got it. Yeah, interestingly, it's around the one year mark since the Kaseya uh, attack happened. Um, Nidzan was talking about proxy shell happening in spring 2021. Um, the last about two years, uh, among other things, have been quite fertile in terms of uh, vulnerabilities and hacks and it's all melded together into one big mass given all the responses that we've had to do over those last couple of years um can anybody so say job security other... sorry can anybody say job security for us <laughs> um yeah <laughs> are there any other trends that we're seeing when um like for instance um when you have a zero day published like uh, the recent Atlassian vulnerabilities and you've had a follow on number of follow on vulnerabilities come out recently, are we seeing an immediate spike in interest and attacks uh, on our honeypots? We are. Uh, I think Anshuman talked about this a little bit earlier is that in the first few days uh, after a, a vulnerability is, is discovered or is published or is exploited, um, um, is, uh, kind of uh, shown to the community, um, what we see is an immediate spike uh, of mostly manual opportunistic scans where attackers are just uh, copying and pasting the payloads they found online in the disclosure and uh, trying to run them across the internet looking for a, a vulnerable machine. Um, those are not very sophisticated. They're really just saying, okay, is anybody really not, de not defended anything and we can just grab them quickly before anything happens. Um, Around a week in, we start to see that shift into 
uh, something more well researched and well thought out and um, and really scanning the entire internet uh, being more sophisticated about how they're looking for the vulnerability and uh, when they do find the vulnerability being more uh, more automated about how they exploit it how they build a botnet using the systems that they do find that are vulnerable so attackers are you know just like we find ourselves after a disclosure like this scrambling and we build a signature and then we build a better signature and then over time we improve it until we're, we're happy uh, the attackers are doing the same thing they build a rudimentary scanner on day one and then they improve it over time such that by the time it's been a few weeks they've already got the super sophisticated scanner that can identify the different types of vulnerabilities use various evasion techniques and if it finds a vulnerability exploit it right away without waiting for manual intervention got it so can you go into some more detail about what we are actually seeing with the atlassian vulnerabilities in terms of uh, attacks and exploit attempts yeah like we we kind of as Nizar mentioned right we have a bunch of uh, monitors and things detector things in place which will where we capture honeypots where we capture data that we see and because uh, as it goes and becomes automated uh, honeypots start capturing all of these uh, endpoints or all the payloads that come in the initial part of it that we saw were like just queries right the an example was uh, someone trying to send a data with uh, linux command of who am i just to check whether that can be executed on the server uh, once they were comfortable and they had gathered a bunch of servers where this thing was kind of responding back. The next thing they did was drop some sort of a web shell so that they could control the servers. After that, because web shell is comparative, comparatively lighter, it is more it is more than a simple command, but it is comparatively lighter than a malware. So first they did this shell, and once they were able to do that, then it was followed by kind of a malware packets that got dropped into the systems and the expectation was that they would uh, execute it as and when required and through the command and control thing that normally happens. And as as we mentioned in the previous question also, this it the malware was of all sorts, including coin miners, because everyone requires additional power to get as much coins as they can. So yeah, servers are a good place to do that mining and because these are web applications, which are of course running on servers, they, they have high CPU capability. So good place for hackers to actually utilize it. Yeah, um, it is interesting. And I think we're going to be doing a deep dive into one of the coin miner scripts that we saw in uh, our honeypots uh, targeting the Atlassian vulnerability uh, quite soon. Um, so switching a bit to the defensive side of the house, how are the organizations doing against these application attacks? Are they doing well? Um, are they uh, catching up? Uh, how is it uh, going? They are not doing well at all. Uh, we did a survey last year where we, uh, we surveyed uh, over 500, I think it was closer to 700 IT security professionals. And we asked them a bunch of questions about their application security and their applications and incidents. And um, we found that just about 75% of our respondents had had an, a successful application compromise or incident in the past 12 months. So uh, it, clearly the attackers are winning in the short term. Uh, I think all of these attacks, all these different types of attacks, these, these new um, ways in which attackers try to compromise systems, uh, there's something that the defenders are not yet really fully uh, set up for, and so they're they're falling uh, vulnerable very often. It's actually a, quite a big number. Um, so, what are the types of actual application attacks that are causing this harm? Are they the traditional kind of SQL injection kind of hacks, or are some other types of newer attacks coming in that are causing uh, uh, much more damage than before? So the traditional things still continue to be there, right? So all these mm -hmm. uh, attacks that you see um, on Kaseya or uh, Classier, et cetera, they would in one category fall into an injection attack because someone was trying to inject something into a website and all of that. So that, that is, those things continue. 
but what we uh, now see is something we call our new abcs of security it is api security because lots and lots of applications not just have a web front end but have a mobile app front end and so they may have apis uh, behind the scenes running uh, lots of businesses do b2b business and they need apis in that context uh, there is an overall uh, market require uh, shift towards uh, an api first type of design so that eventually when uh, companies have to integrate with third party roll out a mobile app do whatever right uh, add to a marketplace all of the apis help so there has been an explosion in apis and there has been an attack uh, kind of magnet thing happening on the apis as well so that is one thing. The second part is bots. So the A is API, B is bots. And all the automated attacks are happening through the bots. And when we talk about bots, they fall in the two categories of things. One is uh, an automated system trying to find vulnerabilities into your system. There's this other category of bots, which is automated systems doing kind of trying to create disruption for your business by scraping inventory or scraping data from a website, etc. So there are uh, different categories of automated bot attacks. So that is there. And third is, of course, this uh, client side protection. Lots of attacks, for example, mage cart attack that uh, we have heard of in British Airways, etc. happened through uh, what is known as client side attacks. The attack happened in the customer's browser, not on the server side. So detecting that and figuring it out, those are the three uh, important things that we've seen in the last few years. Got it. So can we talk a little bit about API attacks and bots? Uh, it's kind of, uh, it almost seems like a bit of a, a marriage uh, that would work out very well um, in terms of, at least for the attackers, not for the defenders. Um, it's like they're two very closely related things. They are, and, and like you said, that does work out really well for the attackers. Um, as Anshuman was saying, these APIs, really an API when you think about it is a an interface by which a computer talks to another computer. Now, uh, if you think about a normal website where you see a, a page and you click a button, uh, that's a little bit harder for a, a bot or an attacker to exploit. Whereas uh, if they're talking directly computer to computer, uh, it's actually easier for them because they get access to a lot more attack surface area. They get direct access to your backend. Uh, not through a presentation layer. And so um, it, it does give them additional options to attack that they didn't have in traditional applications. And uh, it, it, they do get, there is a marriage between bots and API attacks because bots are frequently the, the, the uh, code, the systems that perform these API attacks. So uh, you have a bot that goes in and, and crawls an API and looks for exploits, looks for uh, issues, and then uh, uses those issues. And it's, it's much harder to detect because um, in traditional bot protection, you're saying, okay, does this look like a human? Does it act like a human? But when it comes to APIs, you know you're actually talking to another system, not a human. And so there is you, you can't really ask, is this a human? You know it's not. The question you have to ask is, is it a legitimate client of this API, uh, which is a lot harder. You really have to start looking at behaviors and, and what they're doing versus what legitimate users do and uh, really taking the whole thing apart and understanding, to, is it malicious or is it not malicious? Yeah, and there is this whole ecosystem of security that has been built in around web applications, right? So there are scanners that can scan websites. And so they have great knowledge about how the applications are written themselves. Uh, though that category of solutions are also catching up with testing of APIs themselves. And because right. APIs just get embedded, uh, a developer could, by mistake, leave out some APIs that were supposed to be internal. All of a sudden, they become available externally. Uh, a security admin may not even get to know that five APIs are lying out there, which shouldn't be there. So mm -hmm. There are a whole host of new issues that start coming up in the context of securing uh, the APIs. Right. And I believe. Uh... Yeah, API discovery is a big thing. Shadow APIs are a massive problem. And I think in the actual state of the AppSec report, we did see that uh, when it comes to API, security concerns are still the top of mind. And uh, um, it was interesting to see that even uh, in 2018, when 
Gartner released a report on API maturity, this was the same uh, response they had, practically the same responses in terms of uh, preference, with security being the biggest problem. Um, we've talked about the A and the B. Uh, let's talk about the C. Uh, what is uh, the impact of uh, client-side attacks now? So, well, as Anshuman was saying earlier, the, the client-side attacks are really um, have to do with your software supply chain. That's why they're also called supply chain attacks or software supply chain attacks, which is you build your application using 100 different libraries. And each of those 100 libraries uh, have, include another five or 10 libraries. And you know the, the hierarchy continues such that by the end of the story, your application can have literally hundreds. I mean, I think our own WAF as a service has over 500 different small libraries included inside it. Uh, as we build the application. So uh, it's enough for one of those libraries to be compromised and your entire application is compromised because all of them are, are sort of compiled. It's not exactly compiled, but uh, they're, they're included in the same application bundle and they all have the same control. So one compromised line of code brings down the entire application. Yeah. And this, the, the critical part of this type of attack is that it does not happen on the server. So any security element that you put in front of your server to ensure that if the traffic from the client is going to your server, you will detect it. Uh, that does not even happen because this uh, part of attack is happening in the client's browser most of the times. And anything that the hacker is trying to do is they'll try to extract data from within the browser and post it directly to their own servers. That data will never even come on the server side. So the challenge is how do security people extend the envelope of security even into the client's uh, browser side, so as to say, right? So right, there were it's, lot... it, it's really, when you, th when you think about it, um, both the APIs, as Anjuman was saying, and now the client-side protection, it's we have these traditional scanners that find certain vulnerabilities, but now the, the vulnerabilities are shifting and the ways to find them are shifting, and uh, the, the defenders are not necessarily <laughs> keeping up with what's happening with the attackers. And so a lot of organizations are yeah. finding themselves in, in trouble. And in fact, um, the recent Verizon data breach investigation report, the DBIR, um, you know, if you look at it a few years ago, point of sale attacks were uh, a top attack vector. So if you think about all the card skimming breaches where you'd walk into a store and you'd swipe your credit card and uh, that would get transmitted to an attacker, uh, these days those attacks are done using the, the virtual point of sale, so the online point of sale. You enter your credit card number into a website and it's skimmed and sent off to an attacker without you ever having set foot in a store. Yep. Yeah. Uh... Point of sale is the problem always, uh, <clears throat> one way or the other. Um, so with all these attack vectors that are cropping up for application attacks, um, what are some recommendations for our listeners? Because um, like you said, the defenders are st seriously held back, right? Like the Baka, scanner, Baka skimmer that Visa had found a few years ago, which essentially is a virtual point of sale attack, um, had so many uh, different uh, protections in it to make sure that it did not run uh, on the system that it, uh, it ran in memory. So you could not make a copy of it. If it detected any kind of uh, sandboxing or a scanner, it would uh, kill itself and all those things. Um, essentially, what would be your recommendations to our listeners about uh, protecting against application attacks? So first of all, before we go into the application level, I would recommend that organizations just get some sort of a, an internal audit, external audit to understand what is their threat landscape, right? Their, uh, where the attacks can come from. Most of the times uh, we see all the malware and ransomware stuff coming through email. That has been predominantly the way in which uh, malware or ransomware has come into organization. But that is changing. That is now coming in through applications. And we saw the Kaseya thing also was a ransomware thing which got dropped via the applications. So emails are the email is there application security is there in fact application uh, application as a vulnerability 
area has increased significantly. So the attack surface is much more in case of application security. Now you add API as an, uh, another sub attack surface on application security, it becomes much more. So get some sense, uh, organizations need to get some sense of where all the attacks can come from and then look at how the customers could be impacted. Uh, there is always a short of trained security um, people out there, people who can do uh, all this type of security. So choose your partners properly and all of that. Those are some of the recommendations that are, we can go into it a lot, uh, Nidza. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, th this is probably the time for a little bit of self-promotion, right? Um, I think it was uh, Jamie Dickin on Twitter said the best security is the one that gets implemented, not the one that is just talked about. Uh, and we we absolutely see that in our customers. They'll talk the talk, you know, the auditor will say something and they'll go and make a big plan. But in the end, uh, they may not even activate those pieces of the plan. They may not even turn them on. And so what you really need is you need um, a partner, a vendor that will uh, do that will that will cover all of these different types of attacks for you in probably one solution because you probably don't have the time and the energy to integrate multiple solutions for a single application. Um, so you really need that platform that will do the ABCs as well as the um, the traditional OWASP top 10 and other attacks. And you need it to be easy, you need it to be simple, you need to be able to get started quickly, otherwise you'll never get to it and you just won't be protected. Yep. Um, we are nearly at the end of the show, and uh, since we're talking about our platform, any final thoughts or advice about uh, actual uh, implementation of application security? Well, we have our, uh, again, you know, time for a little bit of self-promotion. We have our Barracuda Cloud Application Protection, our CAP platform. Um, and it really provides air cover for, for these kinds of uh, vulnerabilities that we've talked about on today's show. Right, uh, we have that platform. The platform includes all the different types of protection: API protection, bot protection, client-side protection, uh, OWASP top 10 protection, DDoS protection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it works really well because it's it's easy. Uh, you only install or configure one platform, um, and then everything sort of gets installed as part of that. And so you get protection against all the different types of attacks that we've talked about and many others uh, with one system. And uh, we like to think we, we build our system to be very, very easy to implement. Uh, and therefore we see our customers actually implementing it and turning it on as opposed to a complex solution that only gets talked about like that tweet. Um, and so that's, that's definitely what we try to do and what we're seeing. And uh, we'd obviously love for you to give it a try. Yep. All right. So don't and just monitor, actually block bad stuff. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, and that is the end of uh, our show today. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Nidzan and Anshuman. Appreciate your insights. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. Um, folks uh, who are watching, remember that you can watch all our LinkedIn live shows from the Barracuda LinkedIn page. Um, for now, uh, like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. This isn't YouTube. Uh, for now, that leaves me to say, until next time, do have a safe journey. Thank you and have a good day.